Story of Nikhil Kamath begins at age 14 when he dropped out of school and didn't really know what he's going to do next with his life. At age 33, he became one of the country's youngest billionaires and is the co-founder of one of the country's most respected bootstrapped startups, Zerodha. We've already had Nitin Kamath, Nikhil's elder brother on the show, speak about the story of Zerodha. This is Nikhil Kamath's story, his version of Zerodha, Zerodha's plans for the future. And we've also asked him questions about the stock market and personal finance in general. And let me just tell you, because Nikhil's a friend of mine, he's also one of the most relaxed but intellectual people you'll ever meet in your life. Lots of intellectual stimulation and lots of financial knowledge and lots of startup motivation coming your way with Nikhil Kamath on The Ranbir Show. to have another Zerodha co-founder on this show, Nikhil Kamath. Welcome to the Ranveer Show. Thanks, Ranveer. Thank you for having me. Um, now, this particular podcast, mm -hmm. the subject title is uh, Dropped Out of School at 15. Mm -hmm. At 14 or 15? Around that age, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, you ended up co-founding Zerodha with your brother. I think the audience also knows the Zerodha story from mm -hmm. that podcast. Maybe one highlight from that podcast would be how your brother claims that you're one of the most naturally gifted yeah. uh, stockbrokers he's ever seen, one of the most naturally yeah. gifted traders he's ever seen. Mm. So firstly, before we actually get into the story, do you agree with that statement? Well, I think as brothers, we have to say nice stuff about each other, <laughs> at least publicly. So maybe a part of it is true and some part of it is exaggeration, I'm guessing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know... Again, I usually try being very polite with my guests and yeah. I bring this in <laughs> later. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel like I have a bit of an equation with you. Mm. So are you are you conscious of that whole billionaire tag which is associated with the Kamath brothers? Uh, a little bit, but uh, it's a new thing. So we don't know how to deal with it yet. Mm. We are conscious. Uh, uh, but I think time will tell how we are able to utilize it. If we look upon it as opportunity to do more and new things by virtue of having capital, I think is a good way to look at it. Also, uh, valuations do not mean you have that money, right? Like anybody can be valued at anything. Mm. Uh, it's a company's valuation. It, it does not mean you have a billion dollars in the bank. So it doesn't really change that much. Let me just put this in context for the young listeners who may not understand valuations yeah. and equity. Basically, say person A creates a company mm -hmm. and owns 50% of that company. Mm -hmm. Eventually, uh, the world of investments and mm -hmm. the, the financial world would say, okay, this particular company is worth 100 crore rupees. Mm -hmm. So that person becomes worth 50 crores automatic. That's right. Yeah. But what you have in your savings account or your yeah. current account yeah. or your own personal portfolio is different from that. Yeah. So how do the two worlds meet? Like, mm. So I'll tell you in the startup world, right? Uh, typically, when you start a company, uh, you raise funding to go ahead and, you know, spend on acquiring client or growing your company. Founders uh, don't have secondary rounds. By secondary, I mean is when they personally take out money from the company for a long time, typically. Uh, when you do many series of funding, uh, there will be opportunities for a founder to get some liquidity, uh, sell a part of his equity and take out money. Then that equation comes into play. But for the most part, a company's value is a company's value and not very often is it that person's valuation. Mm. Yeah. But do you think of it on a personal level? Because I know you're... Mm. I mean, again, mm -hmm. getting into the dirty details mm -hmm. pretty early, mm -hmm. but you are a spiritual... like guy, you have a spiritual inclination, I feel. Mm. Uh, do you get conscious of it on a very personal level that why did life and, and you're also really young, man. Yeah. Like people don't associate the term billionaire with someone who's, you know, just in their 30s, right? Early 30s at that. Right. So do you kind of become existential on a personal level with that? Not yet. Uh, I think luckily for both me and Nitin, we're surrounded by people who kind of like mock us at every turn. <laughs> like, colleagues and family and stuff like that. So uh, they keep all of this at check. Uh, mm. Kailash, who we were talking about earlier, he gives us a hard time each time, you know, that word is mentioned anyway. <laughs> so, uh, by virtue of having these people in our life, I think we do okay. 
right yeah. now coming to your story yeah you you dropped out of school to become a chess player mm. is that true like that was the intention uh partly true i think okay. uh, i was reasonably good at chess growing up started playing very early i think i must have been 5 or 6 when i started uh you know you play that uh, you played the school level and mm. you played the district the city the state and you played nationally and stuff like that all of that happened uh dropping out of school was a combination of many things not chess alone uh, mm. the fact that a i was not very good at school i don't think i was uh, the best student or got the best marks uh, there were also other things at play like i started uh, doing some business on the side i used to sell mobile phones like old ones which year is this uh ninth grade so this would be 2002 2003 yeah, some something like that mm. a little bit earlier than that also i think wow. yeah yeah and then uh, i i got a job in a call center at 17 and i think the the drive to make money was there from the very beginning and uh, i would say looking back at it uh, i have more regrets about having dropped out when i did because uh, you meet people you know you made friends in college and each time i meet people they talk about how the best friendships and the best times in their life uh, happened when they were in college mm. and i i have never had that experience and nor will i ever so you feel like you've missed out on a certain experience in life that's that specifically what do you regret about dropping out that's the only thing i regret the rest oh. of it i don't regret <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the career yeah, perspective yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. of course not i mean we got lucky like so many times in life right uh, mm. so definitely don't regret that but the whole experience of going to college which is in every movie and uh, you see friends from college and it's reinstated you know all over uh, every time you meet somebody from uh, a group of people who went to college together mm. that i miss yeah mm. miss having that bro group yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> messing around mm. how did you get into trading and um, you know actually you know before we actually get to talking about trading yeah. i heard you say something very interesting in one of your youtube videos mm. um you said that chess creates a very good environment in your head mm-hmm. because it allows you to be creative mm-hmm. within a framework of predecided rules and you said yeah. the same rules somewhat apply to the stock market and finance yeah so chess is less about intelligence and uh, more about the ability to remember every game which was played historically uh, so you need to know all the openings that are out there you need to know middle game end game theory and uh, there are a bunch of basic structural rules in chess mm. you have to like try and control the center develop your pieces quickly castle as quickly as you can uh, you have to follow those rules and then you can you know add the extra thing which makes you a differentiated chess player mm. uh not just trading but i think life is like that uh, you can't not have any rules whatsoever a certain level of discipline i think goes a long way in making uh, every success story happen like what what kind of discipline uh if i were to equate it with trading i would say uh things like having a stop loss not taking too much leverage uh, diversifying not touching penny stocks there mm. are rules in trading there are rules in chess but what you do outside of these rules makes you different mm. but you have to follow these rules got it yeah. um w- again referencing the podcast you did with your brother yeah. we called it test cricket Yeah. it's kind yeah. of like test cricket yeah. like you play a slow and steady <laughs> game mm-hmm. play ethically you play according mm-hmm. to the classic definitions of things um so i just want to highlight something uh, that you spoke about here you basically were talking about the concept of pattern recognition mm-hmm. that okay you've seen past chess games you've yeah. learned from it yeah. and then when you're in a situation where you want to win a chess match mm-hmm. you'll go back to one of your old patterns you say okay this is similar to mm-hmm. that particular chess game i mm-hmm. saw mm-hmm. in 1997 or whatever yeah. um 
and that's the basic concept of how artificial intelligence works mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. when we when you talk about ai powered mm-hmm. products or mm-hmm. ai powered apps that's what's happening at a core level you're feeding in a lot of patterns right that system is learning it and then it's executing things based on uh, mm-hmm. you know what the old patterns were mm-hmm. which also reminds me of an article i read about intuition human mm-hmm. intuition you know how mm-hmm. people say that okay i have a good sixth sense mm-hmm. or i can read people right or i can read situations mm-hmm. uh at its core it's basically pattern recognition mm. i think we were discussing this yesterday yeah right? last night yeah this so, morning <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember when yeah, yeah this morning yeah. <laughs> uh but it's basically you you end up uh reading someone's mm. eyebrow movements the way their eyes move mm. the way their lips uh mm. get pursed up or yeah. whatever it's called yeah. uh in certain situations and then you're able to kind of go back to your own memory mm-hmm. and highlight a moment from your past where you're like okay in that situation this person was thinking in this way mm-hmm. therefore nikhil might be thinking like this and according to the context of this business scenario let me say this or let me take this decision which is a very strong uh, it's a very important trait mm-hmm. in the world of startups mm-hmm. in in just the professional world uh but does intuition come into play mm-hmm. in the stock market as well and is that why your brother calls you naturally gifted at this game I think it does yeah uh, so I've been doing exactly the same job I do today for a long time ever mm. since I've been uh, 17 years old so it's been a good 17 years of watching the markets every day uh, I don't think I have missed a single market day uh, mm. so if the markets have been open and I might be anywhere in the world but I'm in front of my terminals uh, during market hours and looking at one thing for so many years every day i think gives you a sense of intuition i think it does and yeah. do you think it's the same logic that it's pattern recognition at the I, end of the it day it could be i think uh, there is no structure to it mm. uh, if you go back in time like the very early traders uh, there was something called reading the tape mm. they would just look at stock prices changing and be able to discern uh, trends in the market uh, that has uh, kind of like become passe and is no longer true but i'm sure there is some level of innate uh you can call it feel you need to have a feel for what is going on in the market and that helps you decide uh, whether you should go long short or what you should do is it like gambling uh it could be like gambling it depends on if you're levered and you know if you have 100 rupees in your account and in a hurry to make money if you borrow 1900 rupees and buy something worth 2000 rupees it can very easily become gambling mm. uh but if you follow rules and you're looking to make say 15% a year or 20% a year and uh you're in the market to garner value over the long term then it's not like gambling mm. so you know movies like wolf of wall street yeah. or the scam 92 show <laughs> can you highlight certain aspects of the stock market that they've shown which are not really true other than other than the lifestyle like specifically yeah. when it comes to the yeah. technicalities yeah. of finance yeah what have they shown that's probably not how it really is uh so scam uh, 92 right i watched it a couple of months ago and uh, a lot of what he did back then is no longer relevant or even possible because technology has come in and kind of streamlined the compliance around trading right uh wolf of wall street another great movie that i love i think uh, showed people in our industry in a very bad light but uh, <laughs> uh i think people in that era uh were able to drive up stock price and manipulate it to a certain extent uh for the lack of regulation and lack of penetration in the market not that many people access the markets at that time mm. it would be very hard to do that today Mm. especially in large cap companies there is very little uh, you know insider stuff or manipulation or any of that got it yeah now coming back to your story so yeah. you see your elder brother mm. you know getting active in the stock market mm. you learn it yourself like because there's a lot of teenagers young college students yeah. who kind of are fascinated by the stock market yeah. bunch of them step into themselves bunch of them don't because they're mm. afraid to mm. they think that no i don't want to play with money money is mm. too real world a mm. thing mm. so what was your mindset at whatever age you started at how old yeah. were you i think 17 okay. uh, i still remember cuz i had an account with sher khan uh, mm. and 
Yeah, so I did. Uh, Nitin being uh, in the trading world already made a big difference, and uh, it kind of maybe drew me towards trading. Uh, but trading is one of those things that you can't really. Uh, it's not a team sport. Uh, I don't think two people can trade together. It doesn't work like that. There is a different style of trading for every person, uh, and the best teacher is probably experience. You have to, you have to try. Mm-hmm. You have to lose money. You have to make money and then lose money again. Mm. When you go through that cycle uh, many times, uh, you start to realize what you did wrong when you lost money, and that becomes the the teaching from that time period. Yeah. And initially, you're playing with smaller amounts. Then yeah, once you become yeah. comfortable, you play with like larger. Yeah, yeah. So initially, when I started, I used to work in a call center called Twenty Four Bar Seven uh, in Bangalore. Uh, early days of when call centers started, you know, and I I do the night shift and I trade as well, so the money which went in was savings from that salary and I used to get paid like eight thousand rupees a month or something so it was not a large amount of money at all. Uh, but the thing with stock markets is it does not matter what your capital uh, you bring into the market, it is still a lot of fun outside of the money making aspect. To watch something go up in value after you have bought it. Is very exhilarating and addictive in a in a very weird manner. Like, can you explain this further? Yeah, uh, very often when you buy something and it works out, it is not because you did better research than anybody, or it's not because you're smarter than someone else. Uh, it's a factor of chance and you know uh, many forces that people will not truly understand. But I think the human ma- mind is wired in such a way that subconsciously you attribute the stock going up to something you think you have done correctly, and when the opposite happens and a stock goes down, the same thing happens again. You think you have done something wrong, <laughs> uh, so you start to evolve and actually start to become a trader when uh, you come to the conclusion that nobody can predict stock prices. Uh, you could have been doing this for forty years. You might have more information than anybody else, but it is impossible to say stock is at uh, price hundred and it will go up to one twenty in three months. Nobody can make that call. Once you arrive at that spot, then you focus less about predicting the future. You worry more about uh, covering risk in all market conditions. So you think, "Acha, if the stock goes from one hundred to one ten." How can I have the best risk metrics in place? If it goes from hundred to ninety, the same. If hundred becomes seventy, the same. Mm. And then you arrive at a model portfolio which should do okay in all these some circumstances. And then you know you just close your eyes and pray. Got it. Yeah, but making predictions on stock price is impossible, and I think people have to realize that very early. Again, if you had to like you know signal out one particular skill, would it probably be pattern recognition? Over anything else, uh, I would say more the ability to be uh, able to objectively read sentiment. At the end of the day, stocks move uh, not because of how the fundamentals have changed, uh, not because a pattern which happened in the past will replicate itself. Uh, the entire premise of technical analysis. If you watch TV, you know people keep saying moving average, crossover, or head and shoulders and stuff like that. It is based on the premise that the past will repeat itself. Mm. Uh, I personally think market activity is random. Uh, what happens tomorrow might have uh, no resemblance to what happened in the past. Uh, so I don't think that helps as much. But being able to read sentiment, because stock prices move if more people want to buy and less mm. people want to sell. Mm. Uh, so to look at people around you and figure out. uh if they are inclined to buy i think that really helps so understanding human psychology i think uh, you would be surprised but equity trading is essentially just understanding psychology yeah mm. understanding what uh investors are doing understanding what promoters are doing uh even to the extent that understanding what leaders and politicians are doing cuz that in turn has an effect on what happens to the underlying companies right uh for the young listeners could you explain what equity trading is yeah sure uh so each time a company needs to raise capital 
they either go to a bank or uh, they go to you know a private equity firm which gives them money privately if they want to raise capital from the people of india the public they go to stock markets so i have a company x i make 100 rupees of profit i need 10 rupees to grow my company so i will go to the stock markets i'll say i'll sell 10% of my company for 100 rupees you give me the money and then you become shareholders in my business that is essentially equity being created mm. and then people buy and sell that equity constantly and that is equity trading mm. cool. and mm. uh, again speaking about human psychology yeah um so you understand human psychology on a mass scale because of trading in the stock market right does that also teach you human psychology on a very one to one level do you think you become a better reader of people as well uh a lot of people tell me i'm a terrible reader of people <laughs> uh, so i don't know but i enjoy psychology a lot it be it human or you know uh, psychology around uh, finance or even the behavioral psychology aspects of things uh i think it's the most interesting thing in the world to try and understand what somebody else is thinking and uh, what is driving them to think in a certain manner mm. uh, i find it fascinating mm. yeah but if your brother called you one of the most gifted traders he knows yeah. um you know what goes on in the head of someone like that like yeah. like you like if you if i mean <laughs> everyone knows that you're gifted you've kind of proven that <laughs> with zerodha and everything you guys have done but what goes on in your head if you actually born with that gift of being great at finance mm. so on an everyday basis do you constantly think of the stock market are the numbers yeah. flashing in your head no nothing like that <laughs> is happening i wish that were true uh so one thing the stock market teach you is humility because you might have been doing it for 15 years you might have made a lot of money trading uh but the minute you let that get to you the 21st year will you know take everything away because every trade is like your beginning and the trade is not concerned by who is placing that trade mm. uh so it's a very uh it's a ecosystem which is very leveling because you might have x amount of capital and someone else might have 100 rupees but when you buy or sell to the market you're like, exactly the same mm. uh but outside of you know being able to read sentiment and having uh having a lot of experience in trading and stuff like that i don't think i'm doing anything special uh the only thing i've learned with time is uh the rules that i have in my trading systems and these are not fancy or these are not things which are difficult to replicate you know very simple stuff as long as you do the simple stuff correctly and uh, you don't have ridiculous expectations you can't go into the market thinking i'll make 30 40% every year mm. uh, if the risk free rate of a certain country is at say 5% and inflation is around that if you're making 9 10% a year uh, i think it's an incredibly good return mm. if you're trying to achieve that i think uh, stock markets are a great place uh, the one thing people forget when you compare stock market with other investments like real estate or uh, bank fixed deposits and everything else that is available in india is the liquid nature of stock markets mm. you can sell it at any point of time and you can take out money uh, and that makes this product uh, a lot better than other products which don't have that aspect of liquidity mm. uh, we all talk about why so many people are coming into the markets today i personally think that place that has a huge factor to play in all this uh, people in the pandemic realize they might have a plot of land somewhere or they might have a home somewhere but if things go crazy and they need to take out that money tomorrow it's not easy but in the stock markets it is Got and, and i i foresee that uh, more money will come in by virtue of this reason as well uh yesterday we were talking about how generational gaps are reducing yeah. which basically means that nikhil born in 1986 mm -hmm. and ranveer born in 1993 are one generation mm -hmm. someone born in 1997 is a second generation yeah. someone born in 1999 is a third generation mm -hmm. so the generational gap is reducing which means the world is getting filled up with newer fresher more advanced and more rapidly advancing mindsets mm -hmm. than ever before which is why i feel that there's a huge burst in the world of uh, 
personal finance, asset management, mm-hmm. all these domains. But mm-hmm. where you know your average person on the road is also concerned with mm-hmm. uh, how do I multiply my money? Right. Be it through mutual funds, right. be it through you know the stock market right. or whatever you have. Um, in in this whole ecosystem that the country is kind of entered, mm-hmm. uh, I think Zerodha was a very right moment app. Mm-hmm. But you guys began as with the, with the intention of just starting a portfolio management service mm-hmm. in its heart, mm-hmm. and then something happened along the way, mm-hmm. and you all figured out no no wait let's mm-hmm. now build product. Yeah. So my question is what happened along the way because if you guys you guys are great traders I'm sure you all would have done a great job as portfolio managers mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. HNIs or mm-hmm. you know just people who are investing yeah. with you, but why did you all go down this road of creating mm-hmm. a tech startup? Hmm. through you know the world yeah. of finance because it's it's given a lot of inspiration to a lot of entrepreneurs from other domains for example hmm. myself in content hmm. after speaking to nitin i really started thinking about how i can incorporate tech into what i'm doing right uh, so i'm sure y'all also had hmm. some kind of an inspirational moment like that and that's my question to you hmm. so when we began at the very beginning uh, we wanted to do broking because we were traders and everything which was available out there was horrible right uh it was very expensive very clunky uh so when we started cost was our unique usp and people came to us because we were charging a flat 20 rupees and everybody else was charging half a percent which is maybe 10 times as expensive as us uh the shift from cost being the usp uh to technology i think uh, uh to be fair i think the credit goes to kalash uh, and nitin maybe because when we hired uh, or when kalash joined us i think that's when we actually became a tech player and all of the tech products and everything around technology has largely you know been his uh, his doing yeah so i think all the all the credit there to him and uh, on a larger scale i mean the only way for us to reach you know millions of people across the country is to have better tech products than other people and reach them online mm. i don't think the brick and mortar way of doing things works anymore uh, in fact bombay this weekend i've been meeting a lot of people who are in the brick and mortar industries so even these guys are now exactly what we are talking about right now they realize how important technology is and they want to adopt it but I think uh I think it's very hard for someone who has done stuff a certain way for like 20 years to suddenly change mm. and become a different kind of company. Mm. Uh I think often in uh, every company's life cycle uh when a company does well, right? Uh, everybody associated with that company, like I was talking about trading earlier, uh is naturally surrounded by people who are treating them uh like they have some superior ability or they're gifted in some way by virtue of what happened to the company uh many times how well a company does is a factor of uh timing uh luck and where who was at what point of time mm. i think it's very important for people running companies to not forget that but more importantly i think you have to understand when you're becoming less relevant in every industry and be able to replace yourself with people who are smarter from a newer generation like you were adhering to earlier yeah do, do you see my generation being for lack of a better word more <laughs> gifted than like the previous generation probably i would say so i think uh, like i'm 34 now and i'm sure in 4 5 6 years uh, i will become less relevant than i am today and a new 25 year old will be better equipped to do what i am doing mm. uh, but i think i have to be smart about that and i have to make sure i find those people today and not wait for me to you know uh, become less competent in a way and then do it mm. that that keeps companies going for much longer yeah and it's also about the guy uh, mm. who started it all staying mm. humble and taking feedback man like yeah. this is something i've seen that even if you recruit younger people to mm-hmm. join your team mm-hmm. sometimes you're too arrogant to like listen to them right so uh, this, have you heard of filter copy dice media uh, there right. are uh, yeah. you must have seen mm-hmm. filter copies videos mm-hmm. this is a strategy i picked up from them right someone asked them that how do you keep your content relevant mm-hmm. considering the amount of content you're putting up how do you yeah. keep topics yeah. 
uh, you know, popping in your head. Mm. And they said that we just hire younger writers every mm. year. Mm. You've hired all the 93 born people, now hire all the 95 <laughs> born people, now hire yeah. all the 97 yeah. born people. Every year you just keep hiring yeah. younger. And at the same time, take feedback right from yeah. the bottle. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think we are there. I think uh, in a couple of years, I mean, nobody remains the largest forever, right? Like we've gotten lucky and we're the largest broker and uh, like we were talking about asset management, we're coming back into asset management mm. in a way with True Beacon and uh, focused on the ultra H&I space. But in a couple of years, like everybody who is, you know, uh, me or Nitin or anybody else who's play, playing a role of leadership has been doing what we're doing for 10 years, 11 years or longer in many cases. So we will have to bring new blood in and uh, allow for that new blood to take roles of leadership because the older people will become less relevant. Yeah. yeah. Speaking about new blood, I've got to take you back to the time you were 15. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what your mindset was then, dude, because you seem like a very calm, collected human being mm. who's doing his own thing. <laughs> But was there any kind of fire to prove yourself after dropping out? See, what happens is once you stop going to school, you feel very insecure. Uh, your friends, your classmates of the time go on to, you know, colleges and they have a certain trajectory. So you read a lot to overcompensate. I think I went through that phase. Like self-study. Self-study. You read whatever you find interesting. But while you're reading, you're not actually reading because you're uh, interested in what the book has to offer. Uh, a part of it is you're interested. But a large part is you kind of like dealing with your own insecurity of not going to college. Right. Because you feel like, Acha, I, I didn't go to college. All my friends did. But at least I'm, you know, reading and I'm learning and I'm not being left behind. Do you think that's a more valuable education? Uh, in some cases, yeah. But uh, in most cases, no, I would say. Because uh, I, I don't think I, I would ever recommend dropping out to people. Because uh, we got lucky, but... Not necessarily a hundred people who drop out, you'll have more than 10 or 20 who get lucky. Mm. So for the vast majority to have that formal education structure behind them prepares them for so many other things in life, which dropping out will not. Right. I mean, and I know that you're going to highlight luck as a big part of mm. this whole process. Mm. Yeah. But other than that, on a very yeah. like human level, yeah. what did you do right from a mentality perspective or from mm. a, an execution based perspective? not from a business perspective. The guy, Nikhil, what did that 18-year-old, 19-year-old think correct? What mm. were you willing to do that, you know, set you up for the rest of your life? Yeah. See, when we began Broking in 2009, 2010, uh, we were coming off the financial crisis which happened in 2008. Uh, stock markets were not cool. Broking was definitely not cool. There was very little innovation in money being spent on doing new things in uh, stock markets. Uh, so we started at a point where there was a vacuum in a way for anybody to do anything new in stock markets. And we took advantage of that. Mm. If we were to try and replicate exactly what we did back then in any other time, maybe in 2020, if we tried, I don't think it would work. Uh, so that played a huge part. And... And personally, I think uh, in, in my entire career of trading or broking or asset management, uh, the one thing uh, I think I have, the one thing which has been a little bit of a differentiator is all the time and hours spent on the stock market. Uh, I'm sticking to my niche. Mm. I'm not trying to build something where I have to start learning from the basics. This is something I've been doing all my life and uh, I'm attempting to do new things in the same industry. They're essentially the same job, but with different skins, you know, I think that makes a huge difference. Right. Um, you know, I mean, and I got to highlight something for you yeah. because I, I just feel you're too humble a guy. So you may not highlight this yourself. Um, I f you, you spoke about sticking to your niche, but mm -hmm. in its essence, that's preparation for your moment. Mm. So maybe the 2008 crash was mm. your moment, mm. but you'd spent from, you know, yeah. 1999 yeah. to say 2007, yeah. just keeping at yeah. it. Yeah. 
Mm. Uh, again, the luck factor could be that you found your vibe early in life. <laughs> you found something that you mm. enjoy, mm. something that mm. comes naturally to you. But you kept at it, and mm. I'm sure that even once you all began zero, mm. there were all those learnings of seven, eight years of work which just came into play, yeah. right place, right time. Yeah. Would you agree? I would agree, and I think uh, what you mentioned there is very important. Uh, the fact that I liked this job. the mm. fact that i like the stock stock markets i think that's the biggest differentiator mm. like after 17 years like 5 years down the line if i were to not make any money i still think i would be sitting and trading even if i were to be losing money cuz i enjoyed that much mm. i think that was the real differentiator i mean they say that success happens when preparation meets opportunity mm-hmm. i also feel it you should add another masala there yeah. which is called the masala of fun yeah. uh, i really see joy in you when you speak about the stock market yeah. or just yeah. finance in general yeah. man yeah. um so now after zero da has been established mm-hmm. uh, the obvious question is what what next like you guys yeah. i mean there's a lot of people who would mm-hmm. probably stop mm-hmm. doing their job mm-hmm. after they've reached a point mm-hmm. like which the kamak brothers mm-hmm. have reached But you guys are planning further, yeah. and y'all are like you know hiring more, <laughs> building teams. Yeah. What's the thought process? Well, uh, so right now I'm spending a lot of time on True Beacon, which is the asset management company. What? Okay, hold up. Uh, I need you to explain to the young listeners what yeah. asset management yeah, is. Yeah, sure. Uh, so if you want to invest your money in equity markets to get a return, you can either do it yourself or do it through a fund manager. Uh, asset management has. three uh, kind of licenses in india you can be a mutual fund uh, you can take any amount of capital you can't really hedge too much uh, hedging is covering for risk by taking a position on the short side y- you got to break that down in uh, layman's yeah sense. sure so hedging is say i want to buy reliance theek uh, hai i want to hold 100 shares of reliance but if reliance falls 50% i want some kind of an insurance so i will buy 100 sh- shares of reliance and then i will also add to that instrument for which i pay say 2 rupees on my 100 rupee investment on reliance to cover the off possibility that the stock falls 30% so if the stock falls 30% that 2 rupees will become 20 bucks and i'll have i'll have kind of like curtailed a part of the risk you're cushioning your loss yeah yeah okay. but that 2 rupees is coming off my upside Mm. So if the stock goes from hundred to hundred and ten, I make hundred and eight. Got it. Yeah. So that is essentially hedging. And uh, uh, where was I? Mutual funds. So mutual mm. funds can't do any hedging. Uh, you can take in five hundred rupees, thousand rupee investment. Uh, they're a pooled investment vehicle where a hundred investors put money. All of it gets uh, collected uh, and aggregated, and then invested into the stock market. The fund manager will typically charge you a two percent management fee a year. And two uh, percent on the money you make. Two percent on the money you invest. On the money you invest. Okay. Mm. It is expensive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it used to be a lot higher, and there were distributors and uh, all kind of leakages in place. The regulator has cleaned it up to a large extent, but still a lot of work needs to be done. The second mode of asset management in India is a PMS, where you need to have a minimum of twenty five lakhs. Uh, you give your money to a fund manager again, and he manages it for you. The third way is a category three alternate investment fund, which is what True Beacon is. Here you have the ability to hedge up to a hundred percent, so you don't have to necessarily bet on the market's uh, long side, or you don't have to bet on a company going up. You can bet on a company going up versus a company going down, and gain from the relative arbitrage which is available there. Uh, I'll, let me give you an example. in a mutual fund if you want exposure in the it space you will buy infosys and tcs in a category 3 aif you can buy a infosys if the price has gone down and you can short sell a tcs at the same time short selling is whenever you bet on a stock's price going down mm. so if something is at 100 and i short sell it when it goes to 90 i make 10 rupees of profit got it so in a cat 3 aif if i think infosys is relatively better as a company than tcs i can do that transaction and make money out of that buying infosys and selling tcs mm. uh, what this allows for you to do is 
not be so dependent on market cycles you don't need the markets to go up 10% or you know uh, gradually go up every year you can just bet cross bet in companies in uh, the same sector or in different sectors mm. that's what we do at true beacon what and what does it mean for the consumer uh, like for, for the consumer you have a stable uh, return profile and a much lower volatility profile than buying a vanilla mutual fund uh so say for example if you buy a mutual fund and the markets go up 10% you make 10% if it goes down 10% you lose 10% mm. but here you can create a risk profile when if the markets go up 10% you make 6 7% when the markets go down 10% you only lose 3 4% got it it gives you differentiated uh differentiated risk profile which is very attractive to many large investors got it so uh, let me just get yeah. this straight Uh, without getting into the details yeah. of the finance and the yeah. technicalities of it you're basically creating a system for your consumer where a really rich person can come and say i want to get a profit from this yeah. money no matter what yeah. so i will park my money with you i will invest in uh, your company yeah. uh, i will, you can handle my money and yeah. you're telling them okay mm-hmm. it's very likely that mm-hmm. you will make so and so amount of money mm-hmm. which is higher than what you'd make by allowing your money to just be back, uh, parked in the bank exactly okay yeah it becomes very attractive now because interest rate cycles are down and your bank fd which used to give you 8 9% or 7% now gives you like 4 5% mm. so people like it and the, what's the minimum is it like you said uh, ultra hnis right yeah it's about a million dollars is minimum and okay. uh, typically 7 crores yeah so typically mm. people start there but scale it significantly beyond oh. that uh the other thing which is wrong with the asset management world today is uh say ranveer wants to invest 1 lakh rupees into a wealth product when you go to say a private bank or a wealth advisor the guy who is going to sell you the fund will charge you 1 or 2 rupees so you paid 1000 or 2000 already mm. then the fund manager will charge you another 2000 rupees a year if you make money if you don't make money he will charge you that and then there will be a lock in period you can't take out your money for 2 years and the whole uh, experience is not very transparent so we are trying to change all of that we have said we won't have any middlemen so no distributors when you invest 100 all 100 goes into the fund uh, we have said no management fee so if uh, that 2000 rupees you are paying with your normal fund here we don't charge any of that uh, we go to the extent where we don't charge brokerage uh, clearing fees custody accounting dmat all of this is zero the only thing we charge is if the 100 becomes 110 at the end of the financial year we charge 10% of profit as a fee so we will take one so what we are trying to do is become more client aligned and only make money if the client makes money mm. but still charge him much much lower than any other fund manager out there uh often people do not realize but if you pay 2% in fees a year hmm. in 20 years compounded that's half your principal oh it okay. it makes a huge dent in the return profile you receive after 20 years hmm. and we felt like asset management in india and across the world had not changed for a long time so true beacon is our attempt to make it uh, democratize it in a way and hmm. make it uh, uh, a lot more transparent remove a lot of the leakages and a lot more efficient richard who you met last night is yes. the ceo of that company uh, who i hope to bring on the podcast you've yeah. got a former <laughs> royal air force pilot yeah. bec- who's like worked in the corporate world yeah. as your yeah. ceo yeah that's crazy but <laughs> from from what you say um, firstly do you think that you said that things haven't changed in the last 20 years yeah um so the, the 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 nerds of the finance world sort of know this like yeah. they know that yeah. okay this is what happens yeah. uh and that's the business model they've adopted so mm. you're applying zero dha logic here again yeah. let's disrupt everything yeah. let's throw in something new yeah god but okay the next next question is mm. these ultra hnis mm. they are customers yeah how do you find them in the first Word place So this It's, is your own personal network firstly. Uh it used to be personal network but uh, we've been doing this for about 18 months now so we mm. kind of like finished the personal network very quickly and now we get a lot of refer- referrals and uh, uh there is a uh, a little bit of press which is going around and that gets people interested and typically people seek us out for performance and transparency. So these ultra hnis would reach out to us on their own. 
uh, and they'll ask us about you know how is it how does it work how do we get involved and stuff like that so with zero that you're basically tackling your everyday consumer which mm-hmm. is your young college kids who yeah. have 5000 rupees to yeah. spare yeah. and then with this other part of your ecosystem you're mm-hmm. tackling your yeah business owners of the world and your yeah. ceos yeah. of the world yeah it's very interesting though i find it uh, so for a long time in my life i did not really meet people or pitch or do the whole sales kind of thing right uh, uh, so these people a they're very very rich but b they're also very interesting because you know everybody is uh, has a story everybody has a story everybody has a ego and uh, everybody has a perspective they're very opinionated Uh, and the fact that i did not meet that many people for so long and now suddenly in the last 18 months i'm like forging <laughs> these new relationships and meeting so many people uh it's uh, so whenever it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done when you go to somebody and you're asking them to invest their savings with you he's going to look upon you from a certain lens uh so you have to like sell the product every time and I think you learn a lot from that. Even now, like mm-hmm. after you guys have zero yeah, yeah. that to yeah, your credit. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let me get this straight again. Like maybe a ultra H and I's of the '90s or mm. '80s would take those seven crores and probably put it in property mm. or put it, you know, in mm. something else. Mm. And you've created a new option for the ultra H and I's. My question is, what do the ultra H and I's of India today mm. think? Like, can you can you generalize? Can you? Uh, I can. Okay. Yeah. So the problem in India is they're all too real estate heavy, a, and uh, they don't have enough diversification, and a lot of money stays in their holding companies, their main businesses, and they don't like uh, to invest in things outside of that. Uh, What's the logic? Protection, like I want to protect myself. No, I think it's a general distrust of people outside of their own holding companies. I think. Um, in large part fund managers mutual funds banks private banks are to blame because mm. a lot of these institutions have ripped off people over the last few decades and now these large promoters are like instead of going to them we'll just invest in our business less hassle less leakage all of that mm. we'll trying to change that at the end of the day any business in finance is a business of credibility right uh so the way to build it in my opinion is being very very transparent mm. but it takes time so we have started now and uh, i don't know how long it'll take but it looks good so far mm. in the last two years the company has come a long way mm. so again speaking about these ultra hnis yeah. and i'm assuming that you've embraced the sales role recently much I more have. than you did earlier i have am i, I right have. yeah yeah Uh, what are you learning about sales because sales is a concept you can learn as a billionaire founder at yeah. 34 yeah. and you can also learn it as a 21 year old yeah, yeah, concepts yeah. are the same it's it's very humbling it, so you still now i have started again going to like you know a lot of meetings in person uh, many times they will make you wait for half an hour or an hour and in your mind you're like uh, being a bit candid here you're thinking like you know why am i putting myself through this <laughs> and uh, but after the meeting is done and after i have seen what the company is capable of doing i think there is a need for a product like this and uh, i think this company will go beyond just asset management uh, to have a network of say billionaires from across the world say you have uh, a nigerian a south korean uh, american a indian to put them all on a platform and uh, help them connect with each other in a in a manner which is better than what a private bank or a old school merchant bank has done up until now i think will be extremely interesting uh, think of it like uh, because there are no bridges between these geographies uh, a nigerian oil refining guy would never have thought in his wildest dreams to approach a indian cement maker to export cement to that uh, country but if we can build that bridge on this platform beyond asset management i think that will be a great ultimate goal for this company mm. and uh, and information at the end of the day and knowledge is something i really uh, like gaining and this gives you differentiated perspective because you're talking to people in so many different sectors on a everyday basis outside of what you can read in the news this is the best kind of knowledge you can get Mm. I'd rather learn about 
what is happening to cement price by being a part of this transaction then just read about cement price in the news mm. and i think that in turn makes me a better investor and a trader yeah yeah um there's this saying uh, i think from the us military mm. they say that the leader on the field is always right which basically yeah. means that yeah. if yeah. you're in the middle of things you yeah. have the best opinion yeah. on a subject yeah. Yeah. so the news might report something but mm. you will only know the truth mm. when you're living through it and i also strongly believe that yeah. your greatest learnings in life come mm. from learning through people yeah. and if you're a podcast host even better because <laughs> i get to do this on a yeah. bi-weekly yeah. basis man yeah. it would make such a big difference i did a whole like uh, hundreds of zoom meetings with clients and stuff uh, during the pandemic but uh what do you learn from physically meeting someone and talking about whatever it could be about the industry uh you can never replicate that on a zoom call yeah. Yeah. which is why you dropping out may not have been yeah bad for you i mean yeah. again i i hear you yeah. i hear what you're saying yeah. about not everyone should drop out yeah. but as long as you have that urge to learn mm-hmm. and as long as you ask yeah. the right questions mm-hmm. there's nothing that can stop you from a well-rounded education mm-hmm. in life and education is not just limited to college degrees and books yeah uh education is about your own hunger <laughs> and your willingness and your humility to learn yeah yeah i uh, think if if i had to like say one thing i just thought of it like right now when we were talking uh which makes me a a little bit better trader than others is my ability to deal with things logically when shit hits the roof you know like when there is chaos and things are going bad i think i'm able to compartmentalize a little bit better mm. and uh, remain calm and rational and make uh, the logical decision versus the emotional one i think that's important in investing bar right. trading Uh, as with any youtube podcast i've got to make the self obsession about myself now yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh i'm i'm in a pretty chaotic mode in life yeah. that's why i asked you the question yesterday yeah. yesterday i asked you what were you like at 27 yeah possibly to understand a yeah. reference point for myself yeah. uh was there a lot of chaos in your 20s when you guys were building zero tha yeah i mean trading is always chaos uh, it it's by design cuz things happen like this pandemic forget 27 uh, in march was chaos right like markets fell but 30% but why was it chaos for you guys if okay with with the markets yeah, falling yeah. Right? but with your with when you'll have a tech product <laughs> things are just different man uh even for a tech product say uh we are say typically used to a day where the market either goes up half a percent or 1% and down half a percent and 1% and that in turn leads to say x million transactions a day on a day when the markets fall 10% or 15% the number of transactions will be like fivefold mm. and everything changes right like mm. how you service each transaction the amount of time the load on everything so it gets very chaotic and uh, the flip side of scale is if we have like a minutes downtime now like you know uh so relative to every other broker out there uh, all of our peers if you were to like put the amount of downtime each one has had we would definitely be on top we probably had the least amount of downtime but even then if you have one minute uh things like spiral out of control now you know every journalist will start calling you they'll start talking about it in cnbc and i'm talking about like one minute mm. so uh, the market volatility in turn leads to all kinds of volatility right mm. wow <laughs> when when you select a finance career you are at the mercy of the market whatever is happening yeah. in it will have a yeah, yeah totally effect on your whole organization yeah. right to yeah. the bottom yeah that's insane <laughs> um but again like uh, what happened through the pandemic did you guys mm-hmm. know what you're in for because the pandemic is where zero the honestly really exploded it was always yeah. there mm-hmm. it was always growing mm-hmm. but the pandemic is where things yeah. just went through the roof yeah so um i think we we kind of like can factor two or three big reasons as to why so many more people started trading mm. you know people were at home they had more time at hand uh, always wanted to trade didn't have the time now they have it uh, interest rate cycles coming down uh, largely plateauing real estate sector for a long time like in india right residential real estate if you rent a home if you buy a home and rent it you probably get about 2 and a half 3% and the capital appreciation which happened in the 90s and early 2000s we have not seen in a long time uh, so people are coming to terms with the fact that when i invest money in residential real estate a the odds of it 
increasing in value 10% a year is no longer true and 2-3% is not really a return which even matches inflation. So they have to like look outside of real estate and bank FDs to retain wealth mm. uh, against inflation, not even make more money. So that definitely played a part in why all these people are coming into the stock markets. But uh, I think outside of all of that, like volatility, uh, it it gets translated into news and noise. Uh-huh. News and noise in turn uh, translate to more people, you know, hearing that there is something going on in the stock market. Mm. And I think subconsciously you're attracted towards it. Yeah, which is what is happening with crypto. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. have to ask you a little bit about yeah. crypto. Yeah. Before we get to the crypto question, uh, the precursor question to that is, mm-hmm. A 22 year old of today or 23 year old Mm -hmm. of today, that guy has an intention of being rich, Mm. for lack of a better word. Mm. What should his financial decisions right now be according to you? And considering that not everyone is drawn to the stock market as Mm. much as you were also. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 22 year old, let's say earning 50,000 rupees a month. Maybe less so. 20,000, 30,000. 20,000 rupees a month. And you're saving say about 15. Right. You're earning 20 and saving 15? Uh, right? You're so earning 30 and right? saving 15. Okay. I mean, you'd have to be a very frugal 22-year-old. I doubt or, very many are doing that. Or or you <laughs> take advantage of remote work and yeah. just work from where you are. Yeah. Uh, work on your skill set and yeah. probably save money by staying at home. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think uh, at 22, your appetite for risk should be larger. Uh, so, mm, I think Spend money on yourself. This is one thing uh, I have realized with time and, and my experiences in my personal life. Uh, take that 15,000 and uh, spend it towards learning a skill or uh, training yourself to be better. That's probably the best way with the highest odds of getting rich. Because yeah. once you've accumulated that many skills, then probably yeah. when you're 28 or 29. Yeah, you'll be so much more desirable and a lot more people will pay you a lot yeah. more. I would, in fact, say if you're earning 20,000 and you can save 5,000 rupees a month in a bank, that 5,000 is probably better spent learning that skill. So you can move from 20,000 to 50,000. Mm. Yeah, I think that's why. I, I, and you know what? The issue with... At least, and this this wasn't really an issue with 22 year olds mm. when I was 22. Mm. Uh, I feel like all of us had that little bit of patience mm-hmm. and like long sightedness. I feel 22, 23 years of today are not patient. Yeah. And I'm, I'm saying that like some dadaji dude, I'm just like <laughs> five years older, yeah. but uh, I feel like they're a different generation. They think yeah. differently, they're way smarter, mm-hmm. but that smartness is flip side is mm. a serious lack of patience. They want everything yeah. now. Yeah. Without understanding that you have to prove yourself, you have to earn your stripes, mm-hmm. you have to start at the bottom, you have yeah. to learn a lot. Yeah. And then there'll be an explosion later. Yeah. Yeah. But keep at it, man. Yeah, I think I think one big advice to 20 to 23 year olds, especially in the whole entrepreneur ecosystem, is spend as much time as you would on, you know, trying to like figure out what problem you want to solve. On, pi- on picking which industry you want that problem to be in. Mm. Uh, you never want to be swimming against the tide. So pick a sector and an industry that is A, growing and looks like it will continue to grow in the next 10 years. Like wow. I'd give you an example. I think people who are doing anything in fintech or broking or finance right now probably are in the right place because in the population of India, only about 2-3% of our country has direct or indirect access to financial markets while that number is maybe 95 percent in america or something like that Mm. so this population will grow Mm. Uh, so definitely spend a lot of time picking the right sector Uh, like if you're in the if you're a young uh, 22 year old boy trying to start something in the mobile wallet space it's no longer relevant because you know that industry is on its way down Really? Uh, yeah. Like what? Like what's this logic? Uh, I think UPI killed the use case for mobile wallets structurally. And okay, uh, crypto. We got to talk yeah. about this. This is one of the most common questions we get. Yeah. After this section, we'll take some of the Twitter questions that came yeah. in for you. And there was yeah. a bunch. Yeah. Uh, like sort of a rapid fire. Yeah. But uh, let's talk about crypto a little bit. Like yeah. what is your, someone who studies money and the uh-huh. behavior of money inside yeah. out. 
what is crypto uh, for you i'm not mm. asking you the technical definition right. of it mm. do you see it as an opportunity to grow your money mm-hmm. as a consumer like would you put your own money into crypto yeah mm. so let me preface and say i'm i'm no real expert on crypto uh, i personally do not have any i don't have any of the popular cryptocurrencies available out there uh so when you think of currency right uh, what is currency essentially is government debt um uh, explain it in terms of nikhil gave ranveer 10 rupees okay uh so when i give you 10 rupees what that note denotes is if you take that note to the reserve bank in our country they will give you something of a certain value that notional value is that 10 rupees now uh government debt and uh, let's leave rupee out of it and let's talk about the dollar because in many ways that kind of uh is the currency of the world and that in turn kind of makes rupee be worth x and uh, the euro be worth y uh so back in the day when you took a dollar to the federal reserve in america they would give you the amount of gold and that gold gave value to the dollar mm. uh the gold standard got removed at a certain point i think it was richard nixon who removed it mm. and then we had another system uh, the bretton woods system where every other global currency was pegged to the dollar mm. so they said we will no longer give you gold and uh, if the dollar is at 50 rupees you can uh, go down to as low as 45 you can go up as high as 55 but you will trade in that range relative to the dollar uh, that changed and uh, now we are in an ecosystem uh, where the american government has been printing a lot of money Uh, so if you were to look at the average amount of money they print uh, i might not be exactly right here but it used to be something like half a trillion dollars a year over the last decade it became a trillion dollars a year mm. i think now it's something like 5 trillion uh, that's the amount of money they have printed in the last one year mm. logically uh, if there is more supply of something the value of that should go down but the value of the us dollar is not going down because a lot of the countries outside of america hold a lot of american debt and the value of that debt would come down if the value of the dollar were to go down as right. well so basically other countries have a hoard of dollars which they've kept yeah. themselves yeah okay yeah so there are many use cases as to why the us dollar is relevant and we all benefit like take india for example where we we export a lot of services right if the dollar depreciates by a lot our uh, it companies will no longer remain relevant mm. so there are many many like you know tiny equations here and it makes sense for the world to have the us dollar be where it is right now and it's working for everybody mm. now if they continue to print money in the manner that they are uh, at some point in the future it would be logical and plausible to think that they will be you know uh, many people who will question why is the us dollar still holding this much value when there is so much of it available in the world mm. when that happens cryptos will become a lot more relevant because people will stop trusting governments with the currency that the government is providing them uh, i see crypto to have a use coin at that point which, which is how far according to you 20 years very, very very hard to call but i would say much sooner than 20 years uh, and uh on the flip side the problem with crypto is it's not good for governments uh we had that silk route issue uh, where they were selling all kind of stuff online and and the fact that a currency which is not really regulated in any manner is attempting to challenge the global currencies we have today will not be looked upon fondly by governments everywhere because you're taking away control from the government to a large extent and governments i think will make it harder for bitcoin or any of these cryptocurrencies to grow all this being said uh, a currency which is that volatile uh, is not essentially a currency if i told you the 10 rupee note you were talking about earlier bought you uh, a apple today tomorrow you could go buy a car with that same 10 rupees a uh, day after tomorrow you can't even buy a chocolate with that 10 rupees mm-hmm. you would not want to hold that 10 rupee right mm. and not not hold it in the sense that you would not want your entire wealth to be sitting there so it'll be interesting to watch 
what happens with cryptos going forward but i think it'll be a fight which the government will fight against crypto across the world but they will be weakened in that fight if they continue to print money the way they are today hmm got it um yeah. would you invest money in crypto in the next 2 or 3 years because that's the trend right yeah. now especially the world of twitter is overtaken by <laughs> cryptocurrency in general yeah. bitcoin in general ethereum in general yeah. are you intrigued would you put some money just and park well, it and leave it there if i had to go back in time and buy one thing i think it would be crypto just because of how much it has appreciated but will i buy today probably not i think for the reasons i mentioned earlier i think it is not just fairly but maybe overpriced considering all that is happening in the world today and that it can drop at any point it can yeah mm. totally i think uh, uh, the indian government uh, i don't know when was this 2018 they put out the regulation that banks can't do business with banks can't do anything with crypto right and then all the local exchanges we had here had to shut down and stuff like that i think they've gotten a stay from uh, the supreme court or high court against that mandate but the government has still not kind of said people in india should do crypto mm. uh, but if this happens in something like america we don't know what the new government thinks about crypto because they've only been in office a short while but if they come and they go against crypto uh, i think it could fall 50% in a day you know wow yeah so it depends a lot on these factors which are completely out of yeah. your control yeah hmm uh you know your brother recommended sapiens to me uh, yeah. i was reading the third book by you yeah. all at that point yeah. and sapiens taught me a lot about the concept of fictions around us mm. uh, which basic and and again you all know harari is a big character on this mm. podcast mm. Uh, though i spent the whole year reading all his books just right. opened up my mind right uh anyway coming back to fiction he basically mm. said that that 10 rupee note is a fiction mm. um you mm. owning your mm. house yeah and signing a document is a fiction mm. who decided that a document a piece of paper can decide that nikhil owns a particular house or ranveer exactly. owns a particular house yeah. who decided that um the jacket you're wearing should be priced at so much mm. so we are in a world surrounded by fictions yeah. and he goes on to say mm-hmm. that the concept of patriotism is also possibly a fiction yeah whenever you want to control a very large group of people mm. you create a story mm-hmm. around something which mm-hmm. will inspire them mm-hmm. or create an emotion within them yeah. and therefore who decided that governments <laughs> should control the country mm. i mean this is like a very anarchist style no, no, conversation I, i completely agree with you i um, i don't know how uh i don't know who the audience is and i don't know how this will be taken but uh patriotism in its truest sense has lost a lot of relevance in today's world uh, i because, think because of globalization because of globalization because of gl- nuclear weapons because uh a full war between two large countries is no longer relevant and mm. uh, i think the world would financially and economically be a lot better if not for patriotism like we sell patriotism uh, patriotism in india but we are not as bad as the americans if you go to america you'll find a flag in front of every third house you know mm. if the world were not to have borders uh, if it were not to have distinction based on you know all the stupid things we distinguish people based on uh, i think the quality of life of the entire world uh, the access to resources would go up like the world today produces maybe seven times how much food as the world requires today mm. but we still have people dying of starvation and we have climate change issues we have so many things uh, that will be helped by a less patriotic world mm. yeah. but you, and you know the thing is because patriotism as a concept has been around for so long mm. and i believe it's very good to love your own culture mm. like if you've been born in a particular culture embrace it mm. embrace everything that your country's culture stands for yeah. but if uh patriotism is something that can get you to hit someone else mm, or totally. to attack someone else in any way emotionally yeah. Yeah, yeah. write a hate comment yeah. under posts yeah. then you got to ask questions to yourself i totally agree i agree with embrace your culture uh, i don't think you should fight for your culture if something is dying a natural death or if something is progressing or transgressing into something else naturally because the world is moving in that direction Uh, i think we as humans are too small uh, and i think it would be very bigoted in a way to think that we can change that 
and retain something which is naturally fading away right. i think we have to be more accepting to change not just in uh religion politics or even in companies right things change all the time uh, the sooner you're willing to adapt the sooner you're willing to embrace change i think the more the more relevant you stay for longer as a company does sport add anything to your business career i don't think so i mean uh, to be physically fit is very relevant because uh, if you walk into work not feeling physically fit it it affects you mentally mm. but outside of that uh i think i used to be competitive at some point i think with time i have become more and more like uh, less inclined to be you know very competitive and stuff like that did the stoicism kind of yeah, act yeah. The, oh, okay i mm. think i'm in a very chilled out phase right <laughs> now <laughs> well you know when you realize this like new year's happened this year right and i was like what is the goal for next year to me i had like simple things like sleep for 8 hours a day and stuff like that that i think genuinely means i'm becoming less competitive mm. and uh, yeah it'll be interesting though i i hope it's cyclical you know you become less competitive and then you wake up one day and get drive and uh, when when you got to sign all those ultra hnis <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my god get get competitive about it yeah yeah okay so we are i won't say near the end of the podcast mm-hmm. because knowing the chemistry mm-hmm. i have with you i mm-hmm. think i'm going to take you to many more places but i've decided to include two sections uh, in every podcast one of which is the rapid fire from twitter mm-hmm. where uh, listeners of the podcast send in questions yeah. for you and the second one is uh, possibly a few deeper conversations yeah. on life in general so i asked twitter janta mm-hmm. that if you had to ask one of india's youngest billionaires nikhil kamath of zero dha any kind of question mm-hmm. what would you ask him Firstly, Ramesh Mishra asks, ask if he can fund my startup. I need to start dairy farm and organic farming in my hometown, where my lands of my forefathers are lying idle, and here I'm struggling to make ends meet. In many cases, a business can be started without external funding, and mm. if it's farming, I'm guessing you can get that capital locally. Uh, you know, because you're in the world of finance, you have to study multiple kinds of industries. Uh-huh. What is the future of agriculture in general? Because I hear so many mixed yeah. opinions yeah. from people who've actually been in it. They yeah. say that there's a lot of potential. Mm-hmm. I speak to a business coach like Vivek Bindra, mm-hmm. and he says that no, the margins in that industry are mm-hmm. now are not that high. Yeah. What's your I mean, perspective? I'm, I'm no expert here, but. if i had to wager a guess i would say aggregation is the way forward mm. uh, a lot of what the government is doing also seems to be hinting at that mm. so we might uh, we might have a world where we have fewer farms but much larger and a lot more organized mm. uh, that'll create a all new problem what the farmers of today will do and we'll have to as a government i think preempt it right. and make sure they are taken care of and they have some other avenue to move yeah. to I think you asked me my goal yeah. uh, in about why I'm doing this, yeah. and I said twenty thousand jobs. Yeah. I, for some reason, something in my heart says that I have to do something for the agriculture world. Yeah. Yeah. I've discussed it with one of my guys as well, yeah. who's had a past yeah. in agriculture. I, I have an opinion here. I think uh, uh, there's no taxation on farm income, right? I think beyond a cap, uh, it is. It has been misutilized so much in our history. If a farmer is earning more than a crore a year, I think there should be income tax. Mm. I think they should be taxed like other people in the country. The small farm farmers, of course, have to be protected, and I think that change will bring a bring a lot of clarity in this ecosystem. Mm. Cool. Uh, next one's a little more personal. Yeah. Mr. Hari Haran asks, mm-hmm. uh, "It's great seeing you doing a podcast with Mr. Nikhil. Ask him how he takes his success." after the lockdown and how he's handling it right now uh why why don't you when you expand on the concept <laughs> of success i uh, knowing yeah. you i don't even think you believe you're successful no. yet no i don't think so i think uh, i'm still an insecure person in many ways and that's uh, that's all of us <laughs> my brother <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i think uh i think surrounding yourself with the right people is the most important thing here i think to have people who criticize contradict are skeptical about everything you're doing and uh, valuing their opinion is uh, important i think you stay level headed as long as you do that hmm. um the next question from the same person is what made you guys believe that your idea of starting zero dha mm-hmm. would result in success when you all were starting out what was your initial hunch uh again it was very organic i i don't think i'm a big fan of planning 
also because I've planned many things in life and they've never really worked out. Uh, so it was very organic. We had a hunch that we would be successful because everybody wants to be. But outside of that, there was no like uh, intelligence there or anything like that. Uh, and Mr. Hariharan's final question, <laughs> books and people that inspired you. I was reading a book which I just finished, uh, Fear of Death, uh, Fear of Mortality. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting. Who's it by? The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker. Got it. Yeah. So he talks about how we as humans forget that we are creatures. Uh, we have a certain amount of time here. And the way we live life often is like we think we're going to be here perpetually. Mm. So why is it important for me as a 34 year old guy to know that average lifespan is 70 and I have 35 years left and live my life according to that versus thinking I'm going to live on for, you know, hundreds of years in perpetuity. It, it's a very subconscious thing. I think we live like that and we don't realize it. Mm. But when you put a finite number there, I think you become uh, a better human being in many ways. You become mm. socially relevant. The amount of greed you have goes down and all of that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why I'm referencing this, but mm. I went to an ICSE school where mm. we had some fantastic poetry taught mm. to us. Uh, and there was this poem about a Greek goddess who falls in love with a really good looking human being. Mm -hmm. And she's just like enchanted by his raw sexuality and right. all that. And all that's in a poem for kids. Right. Uh, she blesses him with the blessing of immortality. Mm. But she doesn't bless him with the blessing of immortal youth. Mm. So this dude becomes old, wrinkly, mm. his body mm. parts start falling mm. off. And the whole poem is very dark about mm. how possibly being immortal is yeah. one of the biggest curses you can go through yeah. in life. Yeah. Teaching a 14 year old this huh. changes 14 yeah. year old perspectives, yeah. man. You kind of echoed that thought yeah. in many ways. Um, okay, Mr. Ankit asks, as a founder of India's biggest trading platform, what are the changes you guys are bringing in to pull in the youth of the country? Because yeah. even Nitin echoed this thought that yeah. the youth is the big customer at zero. Yeah. Tha. yeah, I think education is the only way. Uh, I think our system of pedagogy in India, are, uh, we teach kids for 15 years how to make money. Mm. but we don't teach them how to manage that money. I think something is missing there and uh, it would be prudent for the government to add, you know, financial literacy early, like mm. middle school. I think mm. that structurally will change things. Got it. Uh, Puna masks resources for learning stocks and finance for a beginner. And she also asks a very interesting second question. How much finance knowledge is enough mm -hmm. for you to begin investing in stocks? Okay. The first one is Varsity. We have a platform which is great for beginners. To the second one, uh, I don't think there is a finite amount of knowledge that you can actually define because I don't think I have enough knowledge yet. But mm. uh, as long as you know the rules, I think probably more important than knowledge. Mm. Yeah. Uh, a bunch of people, uh, mm. I'm going to highlight Umang Kelani's question, mm. but a bunch of people have asked this same question. Mm. Nitin has got a lot of fanboys and fangirls, mm -hmm. by the way, after yeah, our interview. Yeah. People love his Rahul Dravidness yeah. of life. Mm -hmm. How do you guys complement each other? Mm -hmm. And I know you've answered this in past interviews, mm -hmm. but are there no ego clashes? Because both of you are such calm souls, mm -hmm. man. Like, mm -hmm. I can't imagine there being no ego clashes at yeah. all in like a 13, 14 year career. So my yeah. direct question is, what's your solution to that? And how do you all gel together as a team? I think we have clear demarcations of what we do. And uh, I don't mess with what he does. And uh, we kind of like don't interfere in each other's roles. That helps. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's one life and your brothers. If uh, if you don't have each other's backs forever, who does, right? We remember that. So even if there's a slight clash, we, you know, it'll last for like five minutes or something. Dude, I've cried in front of my co-founders. Yeah. That's how <laughs> like intense. Have you had like those emotional kind of, I won't say cried, but breakdowns? With, like, <laughs> not breakdowns. I, I don't think we've had any large fights, especially not no, about. Like, I mean, uh, not uh, by breakdowns, I mean, mm. on a more personal level, like you're going through something traumatic, mm. not just maybe in your professional life, but yeah. in your personal life, but some of your co-founders become as good as family. Oh. I mean, your co-founders are your family. <laughs> so it's a little awkward, yeah. but. Yeah, no, it does happen. I have this issue where uh, I tend to keep things within and I don't communicate where I should. So my interpersonal skills are uh, not up to par. They're very bad. Nitin on the hand is much better. He's uh, He has great EQ and mm. he's very good at 
resolving conflict with his personal relationships so yeah uh ojas sharma asks how do you keep yourself motivated now uh the markets it's i don't know if it's motivation or addiction but one of the two is at play <laughs> and <laughs> they Got keep it. me motivated <laughs> and what's your opinion on breaks because again when yeah. people are seeing this bootstrap monster mm. called zero da mm. no one thinks that okay it's run by two human beings yeah. <laughs> who probably get yeah. tired and go to the maldi yeah. or wherever you all go but yeah so we don't really miss market days i haven't missed a market day in like over a decade uh, how do you blow off steam weekends okay yeah like we did last night <laughs> <laughs> yes a memorable night man um that that's that's why mm. you know i mean and on a very personal level mm. dude that's such a gift of the podcast because yeah even in real life scenarios mm. when do you have the opportunity to go this deep with another human being yeah so the podcast has helped me make friends yeah which then open up my mind that's all smart yeah. friends i'm making because yeah. if you're on the podcast you have something to share yeah. big big blessing of my life and just like spending time with you mm. and your friends yesterday yeah. was just yeah. incredibly stimulating okay this is an interesting question prayag verma asks what was the pressure like in the early days of starting zero da mm. when apparently you guys were getting threatening calls from other brokers mm. because y'all had like disrupted that whole mm. part of the finance world mm. actually it was not that bad uh, i think uh, it's overstated with time but uh, even at the very beginning the people we worked with were our closest friends uh, like there were people who lived in the same apartment where we played cricket growing up and there were people who were friends first and then colleagues so we had a lot of fun with it we were not making a lot of money but we were definitely having a lot of fun mm. we would play counter strike for 5 hours a day <laughs> yeah to blow off steam like 5 hours a day do you think not that kidding. builds that builds a sense of teamwork uh i don't know about that but it was a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i feel football builds such a strong sense of teamwork yeah, yeah. and team spirit yeah. uh like i force my mm. guys to play mm. football with me uh got to play football after this guys <laughs> uh okay uh interesting question again prashant medicharla asks what if every person in india learns mm. to trade on the stock market mm-hmm. theoretically what will happen it will be good uh i think there are there is precedent there are countries in which 70 80% of the population has like? direct or indirect exposure i would say not trade but even in the us your 401k has some kind of equity component in it mm. i think it will become competitive it will become a larger market and it will become a great place for companies to raise capital at the end of the day is abhishek prasad asks mm. what is zerodha thinking of rural area development and actually i would also love to know this do you see rural mm. parts of india getting into fintech at all or just personal finance as a concept i think I think yeah I think there's a trend which will emerge from all that has happened where urbanization will slow down to a large extent and tier 2 and tier 3 towns will start picking up mm. uh, it'll be interesting to watch what happens and how much uh, financial exposure those towns gain got it okay this is not a question just want to highlight there are a lot of questions about true weekend coming in mm. which is your brain child so and these are like young kids these are college mm. kids who are asking these questions yeah. um Yeah and I think almost all the other questions have been answered through the course mm-hmm. of uh this uh, podcast but I will ask you one last question yeah. from this rapid fire round so Dhanva asks what's the role of newspapers and current affairs mm-hmm. in your financial game so I think she's asking about trading stocks mm-hmm. do you think newspapers play a massive role no how I do you keep up so. with current affairs uh you do read the news but I think uh what what have you replaced i don't think i would call financial earning as news mm. often they are not reported i think reading a company's uh, balance sheet and actually seeing how revenues are changing and margins are changing makes a much more seminal impact mm. than reading news which is being publicized because typically that's just for you know readership and everything is exaggerated right uh and because we've reached the end of the yeah. podcast You asked me yesterday, man. Yeah. What are you planning for this show? And I yeah. said that, dude, I want to ask you really deep questions. Yeah. I feel like you're a low key deep guy. And Kunal Chhatt tweeted about this once. He said that yeah. the big gift of entrepreneurship, other than the obvious ones like mm. money, fame, power, mm. is that you you go through a journey of self discovery mm-hmm. when you're an entrepreneur, which right. is so true. Right. You get to see 
the most naked parts of your own mind mm-hmm. your own insecurities mm-hmm. uh you get to know yourself way deeper right. i also believe meditation does the same because you're sitting in silence for so long you're going within uh but speaking about business mm-hmm. are you happy now and do you have a sense of spirituality with everything that's happening around you well to be honest i have not understood spirituality uh i have many friends who talk about it and how much it has changed them uh but i asked them what is spir- spirituality for you each one has a different definition i think it means a different thing to everybody uh in terms of happiness i think again it's a very relative concept relative to any other time in my own life i am happier today for sure uh i feel less insecure about many things that i felt more insecure about historically can i can i rudely ask you about yeah. some of those insecurities like from when you uh, were young yeah i've had insecurities about feeling less important than uh, i actually was about relationships about financial goals about money a lot at, of things at what age did it fade away all through yeah ever since 14 15 16 it has been there at different points a different uh, insecurity has you know played uh, a more important role maybe in the last couple of years it has been more around relationships feeling mm. insecure there and mm. uh, the people you care for if they don't care for you and things mm. often you know we all have relationships right like all kind of relationships we have friendships we have parents we have romantic relationships all of that uh i have felt insecure in all of those relationships mm. yeah yeah i mean that's again that's many of us do yeah. um because you've lived through your late 20s and early 30s mm. what's that like and i'll give you context to this question i mm. feel like your early 20s about finding your feet mm-hmm. and understanding okay where do i belong mm-hmm. in this world just finding some sense of purpose i won't even say finding your purpose mm-hmm. but just finding something to do mm-hmm. your mid 20s are about probably solidification and learning right learning beyond college and right. academic academics right. uh i'm curious to know what your late 20s are because mm-hmm. my reading of it as a 27 year old mm-hmm. is that now you found your feet mm-hmm. you've solidified it mm-hmm. now it's about getting your weapons polished up for yeah. your 30s i would agree with you i think late 20s become about consolidation uh where you start it's different for different people i'm guessing but you start achieving scale and uh, you become not an expert at what you're doing but you become a lot more proficient mm. i mean i've i'm only going by my experience but i think 30s and mid 30s is the time especially if you have don't have dependents if you don't have kids or you're not doing a in order to be able to do b if you're alone uh, you kind of have to like uh you arrive at a point where you start questioning the purpose of everything a lot more mm. existentialism yeah yeah mm. i think midlife crisis which used to happen in 50s is now happening in 30s because of social media could be could be mm. thanks to <laughs> <laughs> well you guys are welcome because i mean if if you are dealing with a midlife crisis mm. early uh you're probably solving it early yeah. also yeah. through this podcast through this <laughs> particular episode with nikhil um is it scary turning 30 for a man for an indian guy we are told all your life that paise kamao hai is it is it yeah. because because indian guys do go through that dude yeah. that that's that's one stark form of sexism that indian guys face right we are told since you're a little kid yeah. that unless yeah. you earn money you won't yeah. earn any respect in this society which doesn't really matter when yeah. you when you when you think about wealth mm. games and mm. all that but uh, you're scared when you're a kid mm. so when you actually hit that 30 years mm. mark mm. what was your mindset like and what happens to people mm. around you mm. i think in many cases you start thinking i wanted to do abc by the time i was 30 i have not done c or i have not done a uh, you think about that but i think you change a lot more at 25 25 is a bigger birthday mm. than 30 cuz mm. Up until I was 25, I used to enjoy my birthdays. You know, yes, I'm 25 now. <laughs> now I'm like, damn, I'm 34 now. <laughs> I'll be 35 next year. <laughs> Started going in the opposite. Even now, do yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the only like finite commodity in the world, right? Time and expending one year 
becomes less a cause for celebration and more you know like i have 100 i've spent one mm. yeah did are there other negatives associated with aging for a guy of course i know that for girls yeah. this is something i spotted with some of my media friends yeah. they get very conscious of their skin and yeah. wrinkles and aging and i'm just like yo you know i mean even older women are yeah. attractive why have you had this idea that wrinkles are not good so yeah. for for a guy what happens what do you think i think you slow down uh, i'll tell you like the changes you will notice first if you go out and have a drink uh, for example right uh, you would be ha- hung over for like half an hour 27 probably for 5 hours at 34 it mm. does start to change mm. your body takes longer to recover if you want to work 2 3 days in a row and you manage to get 2 3 hours of sleep only it will hit you the fourth day you will fall sick maybe at 25 it did not happen mm. uh socially you're judged a bit more than you were when you're 25 uh for example if you're a single man uh, like i'm guessing you are Like am I though? I don't know. Do you? <laughs> no, <laughs> I I sort of. Okay, so tell us more about it, <laughs> <laughs> dude. Um, honestly, okay, we I'll answer this after you finish your answer. No, no. Tell us. I mean, I think uh, this is something everybody <laughs> would want to know more than the other questions we spoke about tonight. So I mean, because I'm a YouTuber and I put my life out there that much. Mm. uh i had like a very serious relationship till about a couple of years ago that ended in a very rough patch mm. and um that just like it it kind of uh put me deeper into my work too mm-hmm. like whether it was productivity whether it was the scale of my own vision right everything became more motivated you know that there's this saying have you seen the ranbir kapoor movie rockstar i have yeah yeah so i yeah. i feel like i'm in that zone where yeah. they say toote dil se sangeet nikalta hai yeah asli sangeet nikalta hai i don't remember the dialogue but yeah. the, the 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 logic of it is that if if yeah. you've gone through a rough time and it doesn't just have to be through a broken relationship yeah. it can just be through any kind of yeah. heartache yeah. which could be failing in life maybe a particular yeah. business collapses yeah. whatever uh it pushes you into like an extreme drive mode mm-hmm. and i definitely feel i've been in that for like yeah. the last 2 years which yeah. means that i am a little bit emotionally unavailable mm. because my team needs that emotional love mm. and care mm. it's kind of cliche but yeah. i feel like they're my kids yeah and i direct the love there yeah. rather than to a stable yeah. relationship mm. which means on the flip side that i've had a bunch of not so serious relationships mm. they've been relationships have mm. not been messing around not mm. been sleeping around and all that but i you know it's not been as serious as mm. what my older serious relationship was mm. great attempt at deflecting and not answering the question <laughs> 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 talking about my relationships yeah. <laughs> uh never in my life did i think that nikhil kamath would <laughs> ask me this but cool um the short answer is i'm like single right now man mm. um and i've also yeah. strongly it's a, it's a good way to promote the fact that you're single right say <laughs> it on a pl- podcast dude my 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 mom has started pitching the huh. concept of arranged marriage to me yeah and i'm i'm like cool it's yeah. prob it's just tinder for adults yeah, yeah. and you know a, a girl who has agreed for arranged marriage is mm. probably in the same mindset as a guy who's agreed for arranged yeah. marriage which is that why yeah. not yeah um, and i think you can have fun with it you don't have to go the traditional way right you can go on a lot of dates which your mom sets you up on <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the plan man yeah. um honestly also i have dated a lot and i've had my fair share of fun mm. we were just talking about travel mm. there are these moments you have on travel where mm. you're looking at mountains mm. with snow peaks on top mm. and mm. you're looking at fucking lakes mm. you're you're floating in these boats mm. and you're just like yo mm. i paid for this myself <laughs> and that's the real joy of yeah. life yeah. probably i'm at that age where i've started appreciating um just your own self experiences what mm-hmm. you see through your own eyes mm-hmm. even more than love right and i know that you're you're beyond this age and you're back to appreciating yeah. relationships yeah uh and yeah. i also strongly feel when it comes to happiness you have to define happiness mm-hmm. subjectively like mm-hmm. what do you want at this stage of your life yeah, yeah. or what experience in your recent past really caused you to be happy oh yeah i i had this uh, notion that a relationship should be all encompassing like you should get everything from that one person uh that has now changed to it does you shouldn't put that much pressure on one thing so you know you have like a 100 people in your life you get something from a friend you get something from a colleague you get something from a brother 
and all the love together makes you feel fulfilled mm. i think that helps a lot when yeah. you're getting into a relationship do you do you feel that um do you believe in destiny at all uh if i do i don't understand it yet i think uh, often in life i have thought of something to be destiny but then something else has happened along the way and my version of destiny keeps changing so i don't know Mm. Mm. I asked Nitin a lot about spirituality in his mm. podcast, and mm. he kind of boiled it down to just being a good person. And I see, right. I see that in you as right. well. Like the way you all treat people is mm. way nicer than people in my industry mm. treat mm. other human beings. But other than that, like, uh, and I also see a lot of men in their thirties, mm. probably once their careers are set or mm. at least careers have strong direction, yeah. they search for deeper answers. They search yeah. for yeah. spirituality, men specifically. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going through that now. I think the biggest differentiator I think for me is the fact that I don't have any dependents. Uh I don't have anybody to look after. Mm. Uh so everything I do in my life unless the situation changes, uh there is no end goal to it. There is no okay, I I didn't have A now I have A. I want B. What do you do with the B? I have not figured out yet. But I feel if the situation does not change and I don't have any dependents you would probably end up becoming more socially responsible and do more for others cuz at the end of the day it's it comes down to that right mm. and coming back to love mm. I feel that in your heart you're a romantic dude mm. man like the little bit that I've interacted can with can I tell you the truth yeah. I have had four relationships in my life and every single one i have been dumped and i've been on the receiving end of it i feel it i feel it and the reason has been i am uh, emotionally unavailable and a bit like a robot that's because of your stoicism could be that that's where a professional weapon mm. ends up slicing you <laughs> in your pocket in your yeah. personal life exactly that is so true i think what works at work does not work outside of work yeah and to remember that and practice that is very difficult yeah i remember uh, my first co-founder viraj is 2 years younger than i am mm -hmm. so i had that 2 year head start yeah. he's way ahead of me mentally now right. Right. like after spending 4 years in the real right. world but back then um i had to teach him to be a little heartless and tough like right. i had to kill the kid inside him right and that did affect yeah. his personal life mm -hmm. as well and somebody you got to draw out your own system as a man mm. you got to come back and just learn to switch off and still be a child with your mum mm. still be a romantic yeah. romeo with the person you're dating yeah yeah i think uh, what was the show i was watching on tv on netflix bridgerton or something like that uh it kind of made me think about how much time we waste uh wondering how we are being perceived and what people think of what we are doing in our personal lives you mm. know i think if we paid less attention and we did what we truly want we'd all be happier both mm. persons in a both of the parties in a relationship would be happier you spoke about perceptions yeah um dude oh, fuck this is a rude question man yeah. but um you know the billionaire tag does carry a sense of status with it Do you mm. see people treating you different after you 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 know you were publicly acknowledged as a billionaire, and do you also feel women started treating you differently? Hmm. People uh, are probably a bit nicer to you than they were before. I mean, I would be kidding myself if I didn't think that. Uh, women, on the other hand, maybe, but uh, I have not experienced it yet. Yeah. Mm. but like mm. the people aspect like what happens do people suck up uh, a little bit maybe but uh, are you able to spot it yeah i think mm. so. i think so. like uh, what what happens see i the biggest thing i'm trying to change is kind of like uh, be a bit more inaccessible i i was the kind of person who would uh, be friends with absolutely everybody and uh, it puts you in a uncomfortable position with new people the old people who are friends for like you know 10 years and 20 years they remain the same they don't give a rat's ass for <laughs> what is happening or your family and all of that they'll be like you know they will bring you down to the ground very very quickly but uh, it becomes harder to have objective new friendships because you don't know what the agenda is mm. yeah
Yeah. Do you feel that now? Do you feel like a little bit? There's always an agenda. L- little bit, maybe a little bit. It's not gotten that bad. It's not. Uh, it's not too bad, but mm. little bit, yeah. Another rude <laughs> observation. Mm. When I was with you yesterday, mm. I felt like that energy in the room was positive. Like the people you chose mm. to surround yourself with yeah. were positive. Yeah. Me, there were little ups and downs in their own personal world, mm. but generally it was positive. So. Yeah. What does someone in your position keep in mind when you're cutting off slash accepting people into your world, into yeah. your world? Is it yeah. that intention of okay, make, can this person help me discover myself better? Does this person make me feel yeah. comfortable? Uh, I I don't even think I think that much. I think uh, there are two kind of people. One who kind of are negative about a lot of things, pessimistic people who. are generally complaining about something that has happened in life typically takers and not givers mm. and there is another set of people who are uh, warm sharing giving and are optimistic in adversity in many ways we all have adversity right mm. uh, everybody has issues something like money does not definitely eliminate them if anything the scale of issues will become larger mm. but when you find those people i think uh, the attempt to will be to hold them closer uh, mm. in the past i have not done the best job with my relationships not just a certain kind but all kind of relationships because you had that warrior thing with your work uh i think more because i was more insecure uh, than i should have been mm. yeah i i would walk into a friendship or a relationship thinking what could go wrong versus focusing on the good that it was giving me at that point that's your 34 year old speaking up yeah like and dude probably is that that is that something that switches when you hit that 30 years mark mm. that you 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 are able to notice weaknesses in your own character or yeah I mean, weaknesses for me it's happening now because uh, this the general way to you know uh, what i would do is when someone said something about me i did not like i would be like you know very defensive about it uh, without thinking about it now also i'm defensive about it but maybe i think about it before i'm defensive mm. yeah and yeah. with with the relationship mm. what's your goal dude okay and i'm going to be like pretty open here mm. but sometimes if if i'm even dating someone not mm. not very seriously but i am mm. in a relationship mm. with someone and if i'm holding that girl's hand mm. that's probably my best moment of the day even after the most successful or most traumatic professional experience that i've had on that particular day that's what i feel love does for yeah the human experience man yeah yeah i agree i think for me relationship goals are much less the person has to be a b c or d but i'm somebody who values uh the ability to forgive forgiving people a lot because we all screw up right like i'll mm. screw up she'll screw up uh so to find a person who is very forgiving and uh values peace of mind as much as you i think would be the most important thing mm. you know a lot of women have this assumption that most men can't stay loyal and i kind mm. of disagree yeah like there are romantic guys out there yeah, yeah. who want to like you know have like a long term mm. have you seen the pixar movie up mm-hmm. It's got that old woman and an old guy. It's basically shows their love story from the mm. time they were kids mm. till mm. the time they became old, and the mm. lady passes away. Mm. That guy still loves her, and the whole movie is about what he does after her death. Yeah, does something to fulfill one of her wishes. Yeah, there are guys like that out there. Yeah, I also I think all of these norms which we associate with a relationship are very subjective to every uh, relationship. Uh, the key here might be to communicate what you are uh, willing to do and what you're not willing to do and what you're hoping to get from the relationship and i feel like as long as that communication is okay uh, you're fine in the relationship i've done a terrible job of communicating in the past mm. so i should not be uh, any kind of a protog- protagonist to uh, kind of like explain or talk about this no but dude that's the nature of entrepreneurship in general mm. if you have up somewhere behind <laughs> you you're like i'm not going to do that again yeah learn from my mistake because that's what yeah. helped my business grow yeah. this is what will help my personal life business yeah. grow um final question we got to make this selfish and about me man because yeah. self obsessed yeah. youtuber yeah. uh how come you opened up so much like yeah. on this show what do you think i'm doing right mm. so that i can add or polish one of my weapons i think you did it last night by sitting and chatting with us till 5 in the morning 
so it does not feel awkward now and uh, i think you have this uh, you look very genuine and uh, you feel like you're asking a question not because it has to be asked but more because you actually want to know and there is that sense of curiosity which is very endearing yeah a friend of mine ankur varik who is also a youtuber mm. uh, he's from the startup community mm-hmm. he had answered one of my questions during the lockdown when mm. i was having an existential crisis mm. i asked him what's the meaning of life why am i working so hard he said that you'll never find happiness unless you define your own mm. version of happiness mm-hmm. and he said that his version of happiness happens when he satisfies his curiosity mm. so he says that keep your curiosity alive yeah. and try answering it and yeah. therefore your happiness will automatically be alive yeah and i have this unique position as a 27 year old to get access to you or mm. bretley mm. or glen magra mm. or <laughs> you know who have baman irani right just such a varied buffet of people right um that i can live your lives mm. in an hour of talking to you right so that's very enriching mm. for me man more than the money numbers mm. whatever the podcast mm. is not as much for the growth of my business mm. as it is for my own mind So that's probably what you pick up <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed being on the Ranveer show Nikhil. I did. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for mm. opening up so much. Uh I am sure we will have you again on the show. I'm looking forward mm. to seeing you in Bombay again. Yeah. Uh there were some topics we missed out mm. in this but I want to leave it that way yeah. because I feel like there's more conversations yeah. in here. Thank Super. you brother. God Thank bless you. you. <laughs> and I I hope you find everything that you're looking for because I I I strongly sense you're still in the search for things. Mm. um and knowing the person that you are mm-hmm. and just the way you treat people i think that those things will find you before you mm-hmm. even go out searching so good luck with that super thank you thank mm-hmm. you brother